traffic on I-4, we all know, is quite challenging. Uh, they've been working on that same overpass for years, haven't they? When are they going to get it fixed? Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome each of you here to the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association's continuing series of roundtable discussions regarding the opioid and marijuana use issues in the workplace and how it affects our local communities, public safety, and the general public. We had a recent roundtable discussion in Kansas City that was well attended. Got a lot of good information out of that. This is our second one. Our next one will be, I believe, in Utah and then in California. Uh, and we are out among the public talking about the issues that affect us relating to these things and how we as an association and communities and business owners can face those challenges and help people that have those addictions. My name is Jim Greer, and I'm the president and CEO of Accredited Drug Testing. We are a national drug and alcohol and DNA testing company with testing centers throughout the nation. And I also have the privilege of serving as the governmental affairs chairman of the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association headquartered in Washington, D.C. For those of you that don't know about the DASA, we are an association that represents the nation's drug and alcohol testing industries, including collection sites, testing centers, laboratories such as Quest, LabCorp, and Lear and others. Um, we have membership throughout the country. We uh, advocate for our industry, but we also educate the public regarding the issues facing the drug and alcohol testing industry and the general public. We have an annual conference that will be coming up in San Antonio, Texas in March of 2019, where the laboratories and other drug testing industry partners will be attending, including many individuals. So if you are interested in becoming a member of NADASA, or attending our conference in 2019, we do have not only our corporate and associate membership categories, but we also have individual categories. Our keynote speaker in 2019 will be Secretary William Bennett, who was the Education Secretary under Ronald Reagan, but also the nation's drug czar. And you might see him on Fox quite often, anyone who watches Fox in the morning. But today we have some distinguished guests of course, we're being hosted here at Westgate by Mr. David Siegel, who will be speaking to you in a few moments. We also have in the audience today our Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association, Mr. William Brooks, over here to speak to you shortly. We also are co-hosted today by USA Mobile Drug Testing, Mr. David Bell, there. Uh, but before we start, I think it's always important to go around and know who's in the room. This is a very, very formal discuss, informal discussion today. When we talk about the opioid and marijuana issue, there are, people have various views. Um, I got a little nasty email this morning from uh, someone who thinks that everything should be legal and hopes that our seminar today fails. Uh, when I was driving here, I, I said to my wife, I said, isn't that a nice, nice comment to start off the day? But there are people that have various views about these issues, but most importantly, we know that it negatively impacts families and our communities. We also have Lori Reinhardt in the back, who's come from Quest Laboratories. She is a major sponsor of our association nationwide, and she represents Quest Laboratories, and you know they're everywhere around the country. But before we start, we talk a little bit more. I'd like to go around the room this morning. And just uh, introduce yourself and say who you're with, and we'll start with this table here, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm Mary Norman. I'm with New Horizons, which is an Aspire program. And we work with teens and high schools and middle schools. Um, we provide drug and alcohol education as well as counseling. And my name is Ashley Gates. I work for the Facility Program this year. <laughs> How about that table? Um, my name is Alana. Um, I'm a regional clinical consultant with Journey Cure, which is a drug and alcohol I'm Sharon Gleese. I am uh, head of Team Member Services with Westgate Resorts. I'm involved in overseeing our pre employment, reasonable suspicion, post accident testing programs. Good morning. 
AMR for a year on the Westgate Resorts Foundation and Community Affairs. Good morning, I'm Tori Lynn with the USA Mobile Dress Good morning, I'm Brandon Wade with Landscape, commercial landscape company, um, territory manager for Lando Tampa and work with the Tampa team on our drug and alcohol policy. I'm Karen Bellinger, I'm with the Drug Free America Foundation, I'm the program director for the National Drug Free Workplace Alliance. Good morning, I'm Alexander Jones from the Muscle Media Central, Florida, Human Resources Director. Good morning, I'm Lieutenant Will O'Neill with Curtis Protective Services of Orlando. Good morning, my name is Joe Galea, a Lieutenant of Curtis Services from a locally based security company, and the problems and discussions we're going to have here today actually impact us with our clients. Shamani Mehta, I'm with the Public Goods Project. We run health media campaigns uh, uh, for prevention of uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and uh, <coughs> I'm Lisa Greer. I am Jim's wife, and I'm also an NDASA member. I'm Jill Burgos, um, John Burgos' wife, and I work with the Curry Drug Testing. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Burgos. I work with uh, accredited drug testing. I'm the vice president of all of our testing centers nationwide, and I'm also on the board of directors, and I serve as treasurer for Endesa. So I want to personally all thank you for joining us today and look forward to a great session. I'm Lacey Gerard with Orlando Police Department. Hi. I'm Eureka Vantipo. I'm with Catch 5 um, Marketing. I work with behavioral health services to help them with their online and offline marketing, both TV and radio. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Fulmer. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for National Drug Screening. We're a nationwide provider of uh, drug testing services and employment uh, education services. Good morning. I'm David Bell, CEO of USA Mobile Drug Testing. We're a nationwide provider of on-site testing services um, based out of Tampa. It's been the goal of the center. I'm Ramona Bell with USA Mobile Drug Testing. We'll go, we'll go to this table here because okay. we missed you. <laughs> Carol Burkett, I'm with Orange County Government. I run the Drug Free Coalition. And we'll go ahead, David. David Siegel, CEO of Westgate Resorts. And we'll start back in the back back there. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. We'll, I'm going to introduce you on a more formal manner. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm Lamar Brooks. I'm with the International Drive Recruitment District, and I'm also married to uh, Bill Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lori Reinhardt with Quest Diagnostics, and we're one of the proud sponsors for Indasa, and also very prominent in the drug and alcohol testing industry. So, here to represent the voice of the life today. Good morning, I'm Trudy Poole, I'm an education and mental health counselor with Turner Point in Central Florida. I'm Rick Jennings, I work with uh, uh, MCAN. I've uh, been a collector since 2001, I have my own company here. In, uh, I'm a therapist, mental health counselor, and substance abuse. It works with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Chu. I'm the community outreach director with Orlando Recovery Center, and uh, parent company is Advanced Recovery Systems. Jeff Cavalli, president of uh, On Site Testing Circle, uh, nationwide uh, drug testing uh, services, and uh, been working with uh, Westgate for since 2006 to provide drug testing services. Good morning, Tom Alec, Risk Management Department, Westgate Resorts. Yeah, well, I think that's everyone. If there's anyone that did not sign in when you arrived, could you raise your hand so he can get you on the clipboard? And John, if you take around for a moment. Well, first of all, let me just tell you kind of the outline today. Uh, in addition to having our distinguished speaker, Mr. Siegel, talk to us in a few moments, uh, these roundtable discussions are intended to do several things. One, have the community engage in the issues that we face, but also as the Governmental Affairs Committee Chairman for NADASA, I'm responsible for communicating to our lobbyists in Washington and our national members issues that, and positions that our association should take on these issues. One thing in Kansas City, as an example, that came up we had a lot of DERs from employers, railroads, we had some hospitals, we had a lot of employers in Kansas City, and they talked about the fact that the employment area, employers are changing their attitude from being punitive 
on positive drug testing, especially the potential people that are addicted to being uh, healers and helpers and finding resources and so on. And that was a big issue that I thought that discussion was very interesting to see where employers have changed. I've been in the drug testing business since 1993, and I've seen uh, from the companies that I've owned changes where you're terminated immediately, get off the property, uh, we don't want to even hear from you ever again, to now understanding that these are addictions, these are issues that families face out there, and we may have to change our attitudes. Now we also know that under safety sensitive positions such as DOT, there's not a lot of flexibility, but certainly in the workplace area that's non-DOT, employers have certain uh, abilities that DOT employers may not have. But I want to bring up a couple things to start the discussion, then I'm going to have our vice chairman come up. Uh, actually, I'm going to have Mr. Bell come up and talk a little bit about statistics because everyone has on their table some handouts today. And once we get done, we're going to have the microphone here where you can stand up. And we want to hear what you're doing in your workplace, what you're doing as a counselor, what you're doing in your business or in your community to help solve the epidemic, the opioid epidemic, and also talk a little bit about today, marijuana, which everywhere I go in this country, everybody wants to talk to me about marijuana. Uh, recreational, medical, what's gonna happen, and we're gonna touch on that just in a few minutes. But I thought there were some statistics that I'm gonna just throw out to you all. In 2014, prescription opioid dependence, abuse and overdose, cost the United States through health care, workers' unemployment compensation, insurance rates, $78.5 billion. Billion dollars. More than one-third of this amount, $29 billion, is due to increased health care and substance abuse treatment costs. In 2012, approximately 25% of workers' compensation prescription drug claim costs were for opioid addiction. We have to understand also, and you're gonna hear from some of our speakers that this has affected them personally, 2016, 42,249 Americans died of opioid overdoses. 115 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. And in 2015, opioid epidemic cost the American workplace over $500 million in people being out of work, not showing up to work, and other addiction-related issues. You're gonna hear more stats today, but I think the most important thing that we need to discuss is how we can help solve this issue as a community, as an employer, and as a family member, because we have some in the room today that have lost their family members, loved ones, to the opioid epidemic. As it relates to the Marijuana issue, we know that about 31 states permit some form of marijuana use, primarily medical. The state of Florida passed it on an amendment, but it's still dealing with it in the legislature. Colorado passed it recreationally, and they have all kinds of problems. Matter of fact, a recent poll showed that if voters could go back to the, bowl, uh, the polling place in Colorado, it may not pass to become recreational. We all know the biggest issue is there is no device that can determine a person's impairment from the use of marijuana. The police can stop you on the road, you can give a breath alcohol test, and if you blow past .08, you can be arrested for impairment. No state has that ability right now. Law enforcement does not have that ability to determine when a person is operating a motor vehicle in an impaired state after using marijuana. Now, a lot of people come up to me and they'll say, well, Jim, I know people that smoke marijuana, and I know they're impaired. That's true. But the defense attorneys around the country have said, if you ever charge a person with impairment operating a motor vehicle, and we go to court, you're going to lose every time because there's no way to convince a jury that there's any definitive way to determine a person's impairment. That is what we're trying to move toward, is finding a way to do that. But one thing that is happening in Washington and across the states, before anyone answers that question regarding impairment, they're making marijuana legal. In Washington, D.C., the FDA has put out 
just recently came out on the 10th of October, a request for comments to potentially declassify and reclassify marijuana, to take it out of a Schedule One drug category. And why are they doing that? Because the World Health Organization has asked the United States for comments because they are considering reclassifying marijuana and taking it out of a category Schedule One. There's a lot going on. We talked a few minutes ago. The administration under President Trump uh, is looking at this issue, has not been real clear. Uh, there's some talk that the president has indicated that he would leave recreational up to the states, but he may move the Department of Justice and DEA to reclassify medical marijuana. A lot of people have various views on that. Some people support it, some people are adamantly opposed to it. Our association has taken a position that there should be no reclassification of marijuana until you answer the question about impairment. When you can decide when someone is impaired, then our association will consider the reclassification issue. So, today after our speakers, we're going to go around the room. We'd like to hear the comments about what everybody's doing so that I can take this back to our lobbyist that I'll be meeting with in Washington on Thursday of this week and hear how we can, as a community and as an industry that is a partner in the drug and alcohol testing industry, come together to help solve these challenges. The next person I'd like to introduce for a moment is Mr. David Bell. He's going to talk about statistics. He is the president of USA Mobile Drug Testing. He's a member of NADASA, and uh, he has some interesting facts he's going to give us. And then I'm going to introduce our vice chairman, who will introduce Mr. Siegel today. David, come on up. So everyone, uh, you should have a handout uh, on the table. It gives a little bit of uh, some of the statistics we put together from Indasa for you to use in your employee education, your community education, um, people who have addictions. Um, so basically, if you did sign in, we're going to make sure that we email you the full PowerPoint slides so that you can use them in any capacity that you want to. Um, again, as most statistics, these didn't come from us. We, you know, places like the CDC, and some of the stats that Jim provided this morning. Um, you know, some of these, as I was putting this together for you, trying to filter all of the potential statistics that you've probably seen over the last years, and, and for a lot of years until um, the opioid epidemic was really announced and pronounced as, as a crisis in the United States, um, a lot of the st statistics were five and 10. They were so old that they didn't really impact you today. So, so what's here, almost everything on here is within the last two years. So it's gonna be something you may not have seen yet. It hasn't been pr uh, promoted. Um, you know, Jim said that there was 42,249 people in 2016 um, who died from an overdose of an opioid-related incident, which is, happens to be 66% of all overdose, overdose deaths in America. So that's pretty critical. Um, let's take a look at <clears throat> another fact that I thought was pretty surprising is that more people die from the opioid epidemic than from gun violence. And we have some pretty staggering cities in, in the country that, that have that issue. So that was a pretty uh, staggering statistic. And then, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, um, they don't necessarily promote that the opioids that they prescribe, the, the Vicodin, the Oxycontin, and most of you who are here in substance abuse capacity know that it provides the same effect as heroin. And, and so um, I myself can attest to that. I got hit by a truck in 2009 and, and was prescribed an opiate and, and could tell just after a week of, of having an Oxycontin regimen um, after surgery that it was it was pretty addicting. I, I, I actually have family members that are uh, drug addicts uh, because of opioid addiction, and, and so it's touched my family personally. Um, and so this is pretty, uh, it's home for me. Um, I don't want to spend too much time up here today. I know the purpose of being here is really for us to hear from you guys. Um, I do want to touch a couple, touch on marijuana for just a moment. Um, 
there was a poll recently done, and out of it was a, it was a relatively small poll, but out of 600 users, 48% said they have gone to work high, and 39% of those say they do so once a week at least. So as employers, what we're hearing from our customers right now is they're challenged, construction industry, um, transportation, they're challenged with what to do right now when it comes to marijuana and how do they deal with it. As Jim mentioned, there's no way for us to currently detect impairment. And until we do so, there's really nothing that should be moving in the, in the law, but it's moving faster than we can deal with it. So the employers are kind of bound and they're stuck. They feel, they feel locked, that they, they have no way to provide 100% safe environment because their employees feel that, hey, it's okay, I'm gonna go home, I smoke pot at night, I don't smoke pot in the day, um, and then you know that, that bleeds over. One, one other statistic that I'll share before um, I'm done here is that um, in, you mentioned Colorado, um, so the Rocky Mountain uh, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Association, which is a law enforcement organization, uh, shows that since the legalization of marijuana, the traffic deaths have increased by 35%. So I know when they were legalizing marijuana in Washington and Colorado and listening to a lot of the public speakers and, and the individuals that say, hey, marijuana is not as bad as alcohol. It's really okay. I can get up. I even had an employee in my printing company tell me one day that I'm normal when I'm high. I'm not me unless I'm high. And I said, well, do me a favor. You can't work here unless you're not high, right? I mean, it just makes sense. But um, it, more and more now is becoming a challenge uh, for those employers to deal with it. But really, it's a public safety issue, right? People are not making wise choices when it comes to consumption of marijuana. They're taking it into the streets. And that's just deadly. A um, couple of legislation uh, on the last slide here that you probably want to keep an eye out. Um, the 2018 hemp bill, which was now, I believe, expired, and uh, it hasn't hasn't passed, but it's on the verge. It was on the verge of passing the last last I saw of it. Um, as well as Charlie Crist has a, a bill that's looking at you know, providing some guidance to the individual states, right? So each of our states, like we had here uh, last year where mer medical marijuana was uh, more outlined by the governor, and basically said, this is what you can do as an employer, here's some protections for you as an employer. Well, each state's uniquely different, and the laws uh, are, are so difficult to navigate. Um, and so this law would be more of a federally based guideline, and it's, not great for us so um, just keep an eye on that and then again in 2000 in 2020 we're going to have uh, potentially recreational marijuana on our ballot here in florida so huge impacts on our local community here not just in nationwide so keep that in mind we'll be sure to email this out to you guys thank you for being here especially from our association we appreciate it thank you jim you know david mentioned one thing that's very important to our association is not only do we want to be compassionate, but there are certain red lines that I would say that we have. And one of them is our association believes that employers must always have a right to be a drug-free workplace. That there should never be any law that says that a business owner is restricted from being a drug-free workplace. Because there are movements within the marijuana advocacy areas that uh, they, they, they stick their head a little bit into that and they, they say, and they have in some states actually publicly said, that they don't believe employers should be able to drug test. So one thing that our association, while we gather information on a lot of things, is very firm on, and that is that an employer has a right to be a drug-free workplace and an employer has a right to test people to ensure that they are not using drugs at work. Uh, David brought up, there's been several bills filed. Senator Schumer, who's the minority leader in the Senate, has filed a bill that would uh, remove marijuana from drug testing panels within uh, the government. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting with Senator Schumer's bill, he allocates $255 million to find out in his same bill if marijuana has an adverse effect on the human brain and he allocates another 200 million to determine impairment when operating a vehicle. 
Those are two great things. Our association actually told him that we like that. But then he says, let's decriminalize it and prohibit employers from testing for it. So he's like trying to answer a question uh, be before all the information is there. And uh, Congressman Christ out of St. Petersburg, he's filed a bill that would remove marijuana from federal testing. If you were a federal employee, the federal government could not test you for marijuana if you live in a state that permits marijuana use. Now think how complicated that would be. If you're in a state that prohibits marijuana and you're a federal government employee, you could be tested for it. But if you live in another state that permits it, you could not be tested for it. Uh, that bill I read the other day has about a 3% chance of passing. However, you need to recognize that these are the legislative proposals that are starting to make their way into Congress. And while you may think that medical marijuana has certain benefits, uh, advocates for marijuana say, and have publicly said, that if we can get it uh, medically, our next step is to get it recreationally. So those are a lot of things going on out there about marijuana, and we can talk about later today. But the next person I'd like to introduce this morning is the Vice Chairman of the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association. He was recently elected in Washington, D.C. He's the number two person on our national board. He is a licensed physician. He is also a medical review officer in the drug testing industry, which means he verifies and signs off on positive and negative drug tests. Very familiar with the drug testing industry. He's been around for many, many years. And I'd like to now introduce our Vice Chairman, Dr. Bill Brooks. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to welcome you all here as well. First of all, I'd like to add some comments to what Jim has put out there. We as an industry or as an industry leader are looking to involve more and more of you in our organization. And this organization was founded to bring into um, the full law enforcement, military, anyone who does drug and alcohol testing. So we're trying to do something that's never been done before. The other thing that we want is human resource directors. We want people in the industry, safety officers, who are out there in the trenches every day and battling these things so that we have a constant pulse over and above what we see on a daily basis. So we encourage you to join our organization. Uh, and DESA is, is come out of the ground in six months and we've already been on the hill as, as Jim alluded to, and we've already talked to some of the, the people out there that are in the know and that have the capability of helping us. However, we really need more input. Today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Mr. David Siegel, who um, is the founder of, of Westgate Lakes and CFI. He's been in the community for the past 35 or 30 years as an industry leader and has multiple degrees, one of which is a, a doctorate degree from University of Florida A&M that is a uh, uh, a degree that would be, uh, as a result of his philanthropy and in the nation and throughout the community. He has had uh, multiple impacts, has had an opportunity to go and speak with the president on this issue, and there are not many people who can pick up the phone and, and talk to the president on, on a regular basis. Without further ado, please let me introduce to you David Siegel. so much to say and so little time to say it in, so I wish I had a couple hours. Anyway, kind of give you a little background. Three and a half years ago, I lost my beautiful 18-year-old daughter to a drug overdose. And on that day that I buried her, I told my called all my executives together and I said, from now on, 
I'm going to be working on how to do something about this drug epidemic, and you guys are going to be running the company. And since for the last three and a half years, I have traveled the country, I have visited rehabs. I started out visiting the Surgeon General of the United States. I visited the head of the DEA. I've talked to groups all over the country. I've spoke to crowds as large as 15,000 people at Liberty University and as small as the people in this room. So I have, from no, knowing nothing about the drug epidemic, and I mean nothing, I was totally naive. When my daughter was having anxiety, I sent her to a psychiatrist to, to counsel her. And when she came home, I said, what, did, what happened? She said, oh, he put me on Xanax. I thought Xanax was like Advil. I had no idea of the effect of Xanax. And then when she wasn't getting any better, we sent her back and what did he do? He increased the dose. And uh, it was a downward spiral from there. I didn't know what to look for. I didn't know about drug testing. I didn't know about marijuana. I had never seen a marijuana cigarette in my life. I've never used a drug. And here, because of ignorance, I lost my beautiful daughter. And I've dedicated my life to doing what I can to save lives. Her legacy is gonna be that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are going to live. Now, at this point, I'd like to ask the audience, how many of you know what naloxone is? Raise your hands. Well, I'm, ha I'm happy to see that all of you do. But I ask groups the same question, and I, sometimes I don't even get one hand, maybe sometimes a couple hands. Naloxone, as you know, is the antidote to a drug overdose. And very few people, very few doctors, my own personal physician, didn't know what naloxone was, or it's more commonly known as Narcan. The Central Florida Sheriff's Department, the Central Florida, uh, the Orlando Police Department, the uh, UCF, which is our university, here's the second largest university in the country, uh, police department weren't carrying it. I got them to carry it, and in the last year, they, the last number I received is probably a lot higher now. They've saved over 600 lives because they're carrying it. One of the deputies in Central Florida stopped me and he said, he said, if I had to leave one thing home, I'd leave my gun home before I'd leave my Narcan. He said, because my Narcan will save more lives than my gun will. So now that they're doing it, uh, every police officer in the country should be carrying it. I actually carry one in my pocket. This is what Narcan looks like. Somebody could be laying on the ground, turning blue. Take this and you put it in their nose and you push the little button on the bottom. Within, they could be turning blue within two to five minutes. They'll be sitting up telling you what, what they took. It, it's called the Lazarus drug. It brings people back from the dead. It's the greatest invention ever. Greatest drug invention ever. I can understand why a lot of people don't know about it because it's only been around 47 years. FDA approved 100% safe. Every police officer in the country should have it. There's money for that. I got a bill passed in Congress, the largest bill ever passed in Congress, called the CARA Act, Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. It was stuck in Congress for three years. I went to, I was asked to go to Washington. I went to Washington, I lobbied for it. It passed almost unanimously, and President Obama signed it into law in May 22nd, 2016, but he didn't fund it. So a bill without funding is, is wasted. But the next year, it was funded along with the 21st Century Cures Act. So there's money for every police officer to carry it. But more important, every addict 
to carry it in their pocket. If you see somebody unconscious laying down, reach in their pocket, hopefully they'll have a Narcan. People with, with diabetes carry insulin. People with food allergies carry an EpiPen. People that work with poisonous snakes know about anti-venom. But nobody, no addicts don't know about naloxone. Their, their parents don't know about naloxone, and yet seconds can mean a life. When somebody's found unconscious on the ground and they only have seconds to live, calling 911 is not going to save their life. Anyway, enough about naloxone. I'm glad you all know about it. I will tell you this, so it buys 90 minutes of life. It's like what happened with Prince. He overdosed on fentanyl. Uh, they brought him back with Narcan, but he didn't stay in the hospital to get detoxed. He went home two days later when he tried another uh, dose of fentanyl, he died. But it buys 90 minutes, enough time to get to a hospital, to get on an IV, to start to detoxing. If otherwise, every 90 minutes you'd have to give him, give him one. You're not gonna have that much supply. But as I said, ignorance is killing thousands of people. People don't realize, you know, if, I heard a lot of talk today about marijuana. Uh, there's a, it's a hoax that people are, are playing on the public. There aren't enough people who need medical marijuana. First of all, we have Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web is made from marijuana, but it has very low THC. There's not enough people who truly need marijuana, like terminal cancer patients in severe pain. Uh, there wouldn't even be an industry with the people in there. They're counting on the children getting a hold of it. Now, I have traveled all over the country. As I said, I've been to every rehab, Betty Ford, Hazelton, Riverbend Solution. I've been all right. In fact, I just came back two days ago. I was, I was at a, uh, a rehab in Malibu. I talked to people that run rehabs all the time. And uh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, uh, I can tell you, and I listened to the counseling sessions of the people in rehab. Most of them are heroin addicts. I listened to their life stories at the counseling sessions. Every single one, with a couple exceptions of accidents, every single one started using marijuana when they were 14, 15 years old. No one starts with heroin. They all start with marijuana, then they, get, then they go to maybe prescription drugs, they steal out of the medicine cabinet. By the way, how many of you lock up your prescription drugs? Or are you like, thank you, are you like most people who they're laying on the bathroom counter or, or in the medicine cabinet? One of the big problems that Pam Bondi, our Attorney General, told me is that people that have open houses to sell their houses, uh, the people go there not to buy a house, but to, they know the owner's not there, they go to the medicine cabinet and they steal the drugs. Your medicine cabinet is the biggest drug dealer there is. Lock up your drugs, lock them up. Only way. We lock up guns because guns kill children, but we don't lock up our drugs. Drugs kill a lot more than guns do. But at 15, at 15, children start experimenting with marijuana. You have to, it takes tough love, you have to test your children. That's why I'm glad this, this program is about testing. The only way and I believe me, I, I have gone from knowing nothing about the drug epidemic to I'm one of the few experts in the country on the drug addiction, the only, uh, drug epidemic. The only way we're going to end the drug epidemic is to do drug testing in middle schools 
random drug testing in middle schools, and yet almost, there's a few, but almost none will do it. Now in Central Florida, every private school has drug testing, and they all claim to be drug-free schools. And yet the public schools, you can go and buy any drug you want in the hallways. Why should affluent people have drug-free kids, but people that, that are, don't have the money to send their kids to private school, have to, their kids have to deal with, with this minefield? You know, drug tests in a child, the, the best deterrent against them starting to experiment with marijuana is the fear of getting caught. The best defense against peer pressure is the fear of getting caught. When their friend says, be cool like me and smoke a joint with me, they'll say, hey, I'm as cool as you are, but I'm afraid I'll get caught. So whatever you're doing to get into the school system, I don't know how many of you have been to Washington to meet with Betsy DeVos or whatever, whatever your program is, but whatever you're doing, we must start drug testing kids when they're 14, 15 years old. I went to the Orange County Jail and I spoke to 100 convicts, and they uh, drug, drug convicts, and they were all in there on drug charges, most of them heroin. And I asked them, how many of you started using marijuana when you were 14, 15? Every hand went up. So I haven't yet found anybody that uh, that's a heroin user that did start with marijuana so now a lot of people say well listen marijuana won't kill you that's true it's the only good thing about marijuana is that it won't kill you but how about harvard did a study it drops your iq by 10 points you're less productive during your life you you get in more accidents you visit more emergency rooms. like i heard today in colorado is a disaster. Forty-seven percent more accidents, hundred percent more visits to the emergency rooms. But they're getting a hundred million dollars a year in taxes, so they they deal with the problem. There's more pot shops in downtown Denver than there are McDonald's and the Starbucks combined. A lot of cities in Colorado have opted out. Of, of marijuana, but there's there's so many studies going on, and yet nobody's doing anything about it. There's no there's no outcry from Washington. There's no outcry anywhere. Two hundred people will die today from a drug overdose. Two hundred. That's a giant jetliner crashing today, and tomorrow another two hundred. How many jet miners have to crash before somebody does something about it? We had one Ebola death, and yet the whole country was gearing up to new vaccines and emergencies. Uh, I mean, it, it, where's our priorities? There are none. I mean, people are dying every day. While I'm making this speech, somebody died of a drug overdose. Families are being ruined. You know, once you lose a child, doesn't end. I uh, watched this uh, commercial about the uh, fellow whose daughter was killed at Parkland. And I know him, uh, Andrew Pollock, and he's going to help me on this uh, drug effort. Because uh, I, I convinced him, I said, you could work hard to make schools safe, but you're going to save a few lives. But if you work with me on the drug that epidemic uh, uh, war, you can save hundreds of lives, and so he's going to help me as well. But there's so much, you know, there's a stigma to a drug overdose, and people don't want to talk about it. And the statistics that you hear, like 66,000, or 70, I'm sorry, 72,000 people died last year from a drug overdose. 72,000. And this, but that, you know what? That's like probably half of what actually died. A prominent attorney in Orlando died from a drug overdose. The family said it was a heart attack, but everybody knew knew it was a drug overdose. A lot of uh, drug overdoses 
uh, that the coroner takes a vial of blood and never tests it because the person's dead. Why, you know, why test it and spend the money? So every coroner's office in the country has thousands of vials of untested blood. And until the blood is tested, you can't certify what the person died from. So it, the numbers are staggering. Um, the stigma is horrible. Nobody wants to tell you their, their child died of a drug overdose and take pneumonia, heart attack, any other cause. But you're the people who can end this epidemic. And that's the only way it's gonna end. We can, we can bring them back from, from the dead with Narcan. We can send them to rehab uh, to get them rehab. We can pass all kinds of laws. We can prohibit marijuana, but you know they're still gonna get a hold of it. But what we, only way to end it is, the, is the, with drug testing, and not in high school or college. You know, uh, Columbia University did a study, and they found that nationwide, and they found 25% of all college students are using drugs for no other reason to get high. 25%. Imagine if you, you save your lifetime to send your children to college knowing that 25% of the children are, are using drugs. And that's probably, I, I told, uh, asked a uh, UCF student what he thought. He said, I think that's low. I think it's more like 50%. You know, students have what they call farm parties. And you can stop me anytime you want. I, I know I'm going over my time. They have farm parties, P-H-A-R-F, where the admission to the party are prescription drugs. And they put them in a big bowl in the middle of a table. And they're drinking and partying and they're popping pills or taking heart medicine. They don't know what they're taking, but that's, that's the kind of parties they have at the university. I have six children. I'm, I'm very reluctant with to send them to college if that's the kind of atmosphere that they're gonna go through. That I, that if I, out of six, one and a half, according to statistics, will end up using drugs. I don't know if I, I like those odds. But there's so much that we can do them after they're already addicted. Oh, well, let me just say one more thing and I won't go too long. Rehab <laughs> is, is the biggest fallacy there is. Anybody that puts somebody into a 30-day rehab, you might as well just let them die. Because the 30 day, you can, it takes a minimum of 90 days for someone to get over an addiction. Minimum. Sometimes it takes a year, sometimes six months. But when, when you put your child in the, into rehab for 30 days, and that's all the insurance companies will pay for, it's a death sentence. Because they go in, they get detoxed, they get counseled, but they're not cured. And they come out and they fall off the wagon and they take the same dosage that they were taking when they went in, but their body has been detoxed. It can no longer tolerate. More people die after 30 day rehab than any other time. So if you know anyone that's, that, yet the insurance company won't pay for 30 days, so it's usually $1,000 a day. To, probably be better off to send them to the Ritz Carlton or Four Seasons and probably save money. So if you learned anything today, if you know anybody that has a, a child, don't let them don't let them rehab put them in rehab for less than ninety days. There are programs around the country that will take people for ninety days and they'll cut the fees and sometimes they'll even give them a scholarship. But, don't let anybody put a child in for 30 days. Drug test your children. Everybody in this room has children, those people. It takes tough love. They'll look you in the eye and they'll say, oh, I would never use drugs. And yet they're using them. Believe me, they're using them. At 14, 15, that's when they start. Most of them, some of them younger, but the majority is 14, 15. That's when the frontal lobe the frontal cortex of the brain. It starts to develop. That's what controls self-control 
and risk taking and, and uh, concentration and all. It's, it starts developing at 14, 15, and it continues until they're 25 years old. So not only are they stunting the growth, because once they start using marijuana, it stops developing. That's why kids get in so much trouble. That's why they get in auto accidents. Drug test your kids. Get drug testing in as many schools as you can. Don't let people, don't let people uh, put their kids into rehab less than 90 days. Uh, lobby, lobby for it. Now, you know, a, a medical marijuana is just a, a stepping stone to recreational. Every state that has recreational marijuana started with medical. Vote against, vote against marijuana. It's, it's not going to kill you, but it's, it's going to cause great harm in your, in your family. Thank you very much for what you're doing. I could talk for another hour. Now. Thank you so much, David. I'd like to bring up Carol Burgett to give us just a few seconds of information on local statistics. And uh, Carol is the, the executive director of the International Drug, or, sorry, the International Drug Improvement Institute. Yeah, that would be my wife. Uh, is the executive director of the Orange County Coalition for a Drug-Free Community. And she has just a few statistics for Orlando and the surrounding area that are very important. Carol. Good morning. I did want to give you, um, thank you, Mr. Siegel. It's uh, certainly hard to follow after all the great comments and the information you gave. He was such an integral part of um, Mayor Jacobs and Sheriff Demings, who's now Mayor Elect Demings, Orange County Heroin Task Force that was convened in 2015. Because of um, the surge of heroin overdoses and overdose deaths that we saw in our county, actually in, in 2014, Orange County had the highest number of heroin-related deaths than any other county in the state of Florida. So there's 67 counties, and you all know Miami, South Florida, they're twice our size. So we certainly had a very unique problem here in Orange County. We saw those numbers have unfortunately continue to increase in 2015. We had 85 heroin-related deaths, lives lost. Um, and then we've seen a switch. Probably late 2015, is when we saw fentanyl come onto our streets. Very dangerous, very potent, 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. Uh, fentanyl analogs are certainly more potent. The drug carfentanil is something everyone is now familiar with. We weren't then. Um, that is being mixed in with heroin, and it just takes a very little amount that can produce a lethal dose. Um, with the Heroin Task Force, started its work in, in uh, August of 2015, three days later, we had 13 overdoses at uh, the Orange Blossom uh, Townhouse Park, and three of those were fatalities. And that was all, at that time, we said it's just one bad batch, because within 24 hours, 13 people overdosed. We now know that was fentanyl that was in, in that lethal dose uh, for three individuals. So as we've seen fentanyl, and this is across the nation, we're not unique now. It's certainly something that everyone is battling. Um, in 2017, these are numbers from our medical examiner's office. We've now seen heroin deaths go down, 55 reported in Orange County. Fentanyl deaths have gone up. Just to give you a, a, what that looks like, in 2016, we had 68 fentanyl-related deaths, and in 2017, we had 125. So almost a two-fold increase. And then fentanyl analogs, and there is more than I can tell you. There's probably 30 or 40 that have been documented. We had 28 in 2016, and we have 87 in 2017. So it's potent. Unfortunately now, according to law enforcement, people are asking for fentanyl on the street. Before they didn't, they didn't know what they were getting. They thought it was just heroin. Now they're getting this really good heroin, and now they know it's fentanyl, and they're asking for it because it is so potent and, and gives that, that euphoria, that high that they're looking for. So I wanted to get, leave you with just some of those local statistics. We should be getting um, the Florida Medical Examiner's Report will be coming out probably the end of this month, which will give us a snapshot across 
um, across the state. So the numbers I gave you is what we have um, working with our medical examiner, but we'll be able to compare those. And actually, I have numbers for the first eight months of 2018, and we've already seen 137 fentanyl-related deaths, and that includes the analogs. We haven't broken those out yet. Um, and 34 heroin-related deaths, so that trend continues to turn. And something else that we're seeing, and again, we're not the only ones, is cocaine. There's a lot of poly drug use, 113 cocaine-related deaths for the first eight months of, um, of 2018. And some of the emergency physicians that I have the pleasure of working with say people coming in that thought they were using cocaine and end up in the emergency department being revived on naloxone didn't realize that there was probably a lethal dose of fentanyl mixed in with because it's all white powder. So very dangerous. Um, and I wanted to make that information available to you. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of information, and you can get this from the Florida Department of Health, it's the Office of Medical Marijuana Use. Just to tell you, as, as you've heard so much about talking about marijuana, medical marijuana, uh, where we are today in Florida, about 133,000 qualified patients, and there's a process that they have to go through. There's 14 licensed dispensing organizations, and they're the only 14 that are allowed to cultivate, uh, grow, and sell marijuana. There's a lot of places, if you all haven't seen them, I certainly have, they have signs up that says CDB oil and they're selling medical marijuana and they're not licensed to. Um, so if you see those, report that to law enforcement. Uh, among those 14, they're allowed to have dispensing locations. There are four in Orange County um, as of now, but there's 58 across the state of Florida. So just to give you uh, a little stat on there, about 1,700 qualified physicians. And to be qualified, they do have to take a, uh, a two-hour course from the Florida Medical Association. And I think this has already been stressed, but just one thing, as we looked at um, medical marijuana just as Orange County employees, when that law passed, uh, actually before it passed, the end of December, before it went into effect, the county put a policy forward because we are a drug free workplace policy that any marijuana use, regardless of medical or not, um, would be a violation of our drug free workplace policy. And, uh, and that means termination. So we weren't testing for a certain anagram, it would be termination that went out to all county employees so they were aware of that. Um, because that is your right under the Florida law that was passed during special session where it says it does not limit drug-free workplace policies, it does not require an employer to accommodate medical marijuana use in any workplace, or an employee working under the influence. So that's just under the state law I wanted to share with you. And then quickly, as, as Mr. Siegel talks so passionately about our youth, that's something we're certainly focused on. Um, there's something in Florida called the Florida Youth Substance Abuse Survey. It's done every year statewide, and then every other year uh, we get county-level data. Once again, I wish I had that data. So I'm gonna give you what was released statewide. We should get our local data. But um, marijuana, by the way, is the most used illicit drug among Americans. When they did the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, they do every year, it's from 12 years and older. So the most used illicit drug. The state of Florida, you have 1.3% sixth graders saying they've used marijuana in the past 30 days, and 12th graders, 21.6%. It's sad there's sixth graders that are saying they're using marijuana, and those numbers just continue to increase. Um, past 30 day use, um, just looking at the difference, about 14% in, in 2006, um, and then 2018, about 16.3%. So we do see that go up. Uh, another statistic is how kids perceive if use is, is if they're great risk of harm for using drugs. Um, alcohol was always the lowest whenever I've looked at these surveys over the years since 2000. That's not the case anymore. Students see that alcohol is a great risk, about 45%. They see um, smoking marijuana, about 34% risk to them, so it's much less. Using prescription drugs without a doctor's order is about 67%, uh, and smoking cigarettes is even higher at 70%. So we know they have much lower, uh, they see much lower risk and their attitudes are very different when it comes to marijuana um, in reference to other drugs. So I just wanted to share that with you and thank you for being a part of this conversation today. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Carol. At this time, I'd like to call Jim up and Dave up and um, we're gonna open the floor now and start talking about, unless you have something else, Jim. Yeah, I'm 
I just wanted to mention um, something that is a very useful document that uh, is talked about everywhere across the country and actually at the International Drug Testing Conference in Ireland, they were referring to this. Quest Diagnostics puts out a uh, drug testing index. This is the 30th year that they put it out. Lori in the back there has some in that nice box on the table there. But most interesting, it talks about uh, positivity rates. Uh, this year, something of very interest, workforce drug positivity rates was at the highest it's been in a decade. That means more people in the workplace are using drugs than they have in the last 10 years. It also breaks it down by category, positive drug rates, negatives, what they're seeing at Quest Laboratories. It also in the back has something very interesting. It's a calendar of events relating to drug testing, going back to Ronald Reagan's day when he signed the Federal Workplace Drug Act. Um, talks about the train uh, accident, and I believe it was 1989 that really started DOT looking at drug testing. But don't leave this room without one of these because it's very informational to take back with you. So with that said and done, as, as the vice chair said, we're gonna, uh, John, maybe you could help with the microphone. We'd like to hear what you're doing uh, in your area of expertise, any questions that you have, something you'd like to share with us. Uh, most importantly, we'd like to have a discussion. Is there anybody shy in the room? Because that's usually the first person we wanna call upon. Okay, nobody shy? I have to tell you a real quick anecdote here. We talked about, Mr. Siegel talked about drug testing. It is very important to drug test your young people. My wife and I have two, uh, two kids that are now in college. One's graduated from FSU. But uh, years ago, our son went to a, a party and he came home <coughs> acting a little odd, as we like to say, and uh, rushed right upstairs to his room. Now, he never rushed to his room because he usually wanted to go to the kitchen and get something to eat. But his mom and I said to him, son, you, you're acting a little odd tonight. Are you okay? And he was about 16, 17 back then. And uh, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll kill me for telling this story, but he's in New York now working, uh, getting a paycheck. Not a big enough paycheck, let me just say that. <laughs> but uh, he uh, uh, went upstairs and his dad uh, was president of a drug testing company, which wasn't wise for him to do. So I brought him and I sat him down and I said, son, we're gonna take you to one of my testing centers and we're gonna test you right now, today, and we're gonna find out what kind of time you had last night at that party. And he said, okay, Dad, you know, very confident, you know. And I got him in the car, and we got, and I called my testing center up, and I said, I'm bringing in my son, I want one of the managers to do the test, not one of the collectors, and so on and so on. And right when we got to the door, right when we got to the door, he broke down. I told him he could never be a bank robber because he can't hold on to it long enough. But he said that there had been some marijuana at the party last night. So it can happen to anybody. And I feel very confidently it's never happened since because uh, uh, we put the fear of God into him. Plus, uh, he's been a very good young man, just graduated from Florida State and so on. But Mr. Siegel's absolutely right. Drug testing should start young. Marijuana is something that does continue to increase and enhance the potential for using other drugs. So with that, why don't we uh, just start off? Is that good? Absolutely. So what we'd like to do is for you to give us your experience and to talk about how you're dealing with things, not only at your home, but in your workplace. I think all of us have had some type of experience. I know my wife and I have um, with our eldest. And uh, so, Who'd like to start out? I think it works, yeah. And if you wouldn't mind standing up when you talk, I hate to do that to you, Lieutenant, but. <laughs> and again, my name is Joe, and uh, I have a sad story also. I do have a family member who is still alive, but over 40 years of living hell in his life. Also, our company down here deals naturally with a lot of properties, and uh, the thing we normally see is homeless or transients, but we realize more and more it's all drug related. Just this morning before I came here, very locally, I had to trespass somebody with the Sheriff's Department, but uh, it was 1,000% drug related. It's sad. It is really sad. Is. Thank you very much. 
Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Will O'Neill, Curtis Protective Services, and uh, like my colleague Joe was saying, we deal with it on a daily basis, and a lot of times with our private clients, um, we're there and on the scene dealing with the overdose as it's happening. And my question um, to the specialists and um, the test sites, how can we as a private security company that deals with the public get uh, a good supply of the Norcam so that when we come up on these episodes, we can help these individuals and possibly save lives. Um, are we allowed to do that? Is and are we allowed? Is there a legal aspect that we need to pay attention to? And, and I, from a person, if I was walking down the street and I had the opportunity to save someone's life, I don't think I'd ask the question, hmm, should I save you? I'm gonna just let my instincts kick in and do what I have to do to save that person's life. Um, and like most of probably everyone in the room, I've lost two people in one year to drug overdose on both sides of the family. Carol, I'll defer to you at that point. You, Carol has just written a grant and received a grant for law enforcement that should be run, to, to be able to carry, and as Mr. Siegel alluded to, they've had many, many, many saves as a result. Carol. Very good question. And um, I want to go look back at the legislation real quick. So in 2016, um, the work of the task force, and certainly Mr. Siegel, is so integral in providing legislation in the state. I think we were the springboard, our task force, that now requires a standing order legislation. So what standing order means is everyone in this room can go to your local pharmacy and get naloxone or Narcan. Um, you don't need a prescription. We can all carry it. You don't have to say you're at risk. You know an individual. I've purchased it myself. So that's an easy thing to do. Uh, we did get a, a grant, thanks to the work that Mr. Siegel did. It's a SAMHSA First Responder Care Grant. So it allows, uh, under state law, law enforcement agencies were supplying every law enforcement agency in Orange County with the lockdown. Because you're exactly right. You never do know when you're going to um, run up on someone that is experiencing an, an overdose. So. Um, I would just, I'd want to talk to you all maybe offline to see how your association, because there's also the Florida Sheriff's Association and the Florida Police Chiefs Association is also through state funding giving out naloxone. They had a grant as well. Um, and since we're on the subject of naloxone, can I take one more moment? We did a, a press conference last week um, and our fire department now is going to be doing something called a leave behind kit. So every time they go to an opioid overdose, suspected opioid overdose, um, once the emergency responders have gotten that patient into the ambulance and off to the emergency room, there's going to be someone that will stay with the family member that can talk about naloxone. They're going to give them the naloxone kit that also includes our treatment resource information, questions about naloxone so they know how safe it is to administer, and they're going to go through the quick steps on how you can save a loved one's life. That's going to be on every ambulance in Orange County, uh, and that's funded through the Florida Department of Children and Families. So yeah. make sure you know that. Yes, sir. You can buy Narcan at any CVS or Walgreens, any drugstore. It's $75, but you have to buy a packet or two for $150. And we got a bill passed in the Florida legislature, a Good Samaritan Act, where anyone that administers naloxone to somebody who's overdosed, if that person dies, you cannot be sued because uh, they could have already been dead when you tried to revive them. Uh, naloxone is 100% safe if the person's sleeping and you give it to them, have no effect on them. Uh, it only works on drugs. What happens is there's receptors in the brain that control your breathing. The drugs coat those receptors and you stop breathing. The naloxone goes to those receptors and cleans them off and you start breathing again. It's like a light switch. That's why they come, come, uh, uh, become conscious so quickly. And uh, but if, if, like I said, if you don't get them to the hospital, the drugs in them will then recoat those receptors again, and, and they'll, they'll die. So you just reviving them is one thing, but you must get them to a hospital within 90 minutes. But there's no no liability. Uh, they could be laying or drunk, they could be just sleeping, they could be uh, 
they're for other reasons, but it only works on drugs and it's 100% safe and there's no liability. I understand when you get in the lot zone that these folks are going to be coming out of the stupor estate and they're liable to come up combative, so be prepared for that. That is not an uncommon situation and they're going to be very upset that you took their highway even though they don't recognize the fact that they were not breathing or that they were near dead. So with that, let's move on. Who else has something they'd like to share? Let's talk about workplace stuff then. How many of you have had, had drug-free workplaces? And what is your policy on marijuana as far as drug-free workplace goes? Zero. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. Okay. Anybody else? As Jim alluded to earlier, a lot of the human resources folks that are out there today are, are going more toward uh, a less punitive scenario of firing people and they're going on into uh, a situation where they uh, are, are getting them help and it has been proven that by doing that we're also bringing into effect possibility that they're going to be a better employee as they get sober. So, um, who else has something else they'd like to share at this point? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Karen Bellinger with Drug Free America Foundation, and the program that I've done for 13 years is called the National Drug Free Workplace Alliance, and we implement um, comprehensive drug free workplace programs. Um, we were a grantee of the U.S. Small Business Administration for like 16 years for long time ago, but those grants are gone. But um, So we implement um, these programs with employers in Florida and, and some out of state as well. And a lot of them do the zero tolerance, the smaller companies, because they can't afford the liability of and, and the expense and the impact to their workforce of sending someone or allowing someone to go to get rehab. Um, so that's kind of what we find. Um, we also um, advocate, you can have different testing panels, and we, uh, we use the 10 panel test, which includes other drugs like the Xanax and the other benzodiazepines and other drugs, um, where most commonly you probably have a five panel test. So that's what the, the federal test, I think, is now, is that seven panel, I think? something like that, which includes opioids. Extended opioids. So, yeah, and you have to ask if you are uh, opioid, if you want the opioids, you have to ask for that. Um, but if you are part of the Florida Drug Free Workplace Act, you get a 5% discount in our state for having that. Um, the opioid panel is not on that, so. So, but there's a, a source for, you know, you can get good drug free workplace programs out there and it's not hard and, and if anybody has any questions, I can direct you or guide you. And we're also versed in that. We'll be happy to help you guys with any questions that you may have um, regarding drug free workplace as it comes out. I, I helped to found and, and to promote the uh, first drug free workplace policy in the state of Florida. The state of Florida was actually the first drug free workplace that actually offered a reduction in workers' comp premiums as a result of being a drug free workplace. So, who has questions or anything else they'd like to share? Hi, everyone. Um, I just wrote some stuff down as, as everyone was talking about it was really important to address these things. Um, Mr. Greer said that 48% of individuals show up to work in here um, and that TAPs or employers um, rarely have a way to address impairment. Um, that's not necessarily true. That's where I come in, I think, and I just want to share my resource with everyone in this room. Um, most employee or employers that do initially address signs of impairment, um, it, it may end up just asking that question or the employee may respond by saying, well, um, if it's marijuana, for example, they may say, well, um, either it's not illegal or um, there is medical marijuana or they work better while they're on it or whatever the case may be. Um, 
counterintuitively, that's actually the first sign of impairment. <laughs> so um, it's it, that's according to the DSM. Um, what what I do specifically is I will uh, go into uh, corporations or agencies and work alongside um, EAP or employers to educate them on um, signs to look for for impaired employees. Um, some EAPs already do that, so it's just about what questions to ask and how to ask it in a three to five minute conversation. Um, that's part of what I do. Um, so it may be awkward to do that, it may be awkward to address it, um, but it's about how you're doing it, I think. Um, and also, when you do address it, then what? You know what comes right after that so having um, a licensed professional physically go into the workplace or go in and, and speak with the employee um, that's what I do um, and then what I'll do is uh, basically assess the impairment level um, in a confidential air, confidential setting um, provide financially and clinically appropriate treatment options um, and it's like Mr. Siegel said, it's more than just uh, a 30 day rehab. It's what, what the individual actually needs in order to recover um, and to prevent relapse. And then I'll also provide um, information and updates for loved ones and employees while I do that. Um, I, we have a, a treatment facility that's specifically for working professionals. It's called CFP, Center for Working Professionals. And it's, um, it can go as, as high as a 90 day program. And so uh, that's a largely in-network provider, which means that we work with um, all insurances. Um, and last but not least, um, I do this therapeutically. I do this for free. Um, and uh, I don't just treat the addiction. I treat it as a crisis because that's exactly what it is. So if anyone needs any information, uh, please see me afterward. Thank you. One thing I wanted to ask about um, from any substance abuse counselors, any DERs, any employers in the room, one thing in Kansas City that I thought was very interesting was uh, there was a railroad company, a very well-known railroad company that uh, some of us probably recognize, and they had their, their DER, their senior DER at our last roundtable, and he was talking about how they had restructured within their company their employee assistance program to help with employees uh, either come and openly admit that they are addicted to opioids or some other type of drug, but how they had changed uh, their time off procedures where uh, previously when someone went to the DER and said, I have a drug addiction or tested positive, that was very interesting that uh, they have changed their policy from a first test of positive to certainly taking them out of their DOT role, but they don't terminate them. Uh, they provide them assistance. And they had created a code within the company so that it would alleviate this stigma of he's, Bob is off because everybody knows Bob is a drug addict and he's at rehab today. Uh, so he spent a good 30 minutes telling us about how they had uh, structured a new compassionate uh, but, but firm <coughs> policy uh, but allow the employees to feel more comfortable when they come to the DER, the HR department, and ask them for help. So what I wanted to ask is, is does anyone have similar policies or have any ideas of how you address that within your organization or maybe any of your clients address it so that employees feel more comfortable in coming to HR or the DER and saying, I have a drug addiction problem, and will you help me without letting the entire company know I have a drug addiction problem? Anybody have any thoughts or comments on that? Jim, just to add to that, part of what they did as well is they formed a peer group for those folks. That's right. And, and that peer group then helped them to work through, just like AA or NA or, or the other organizations that are out there, that peer group helps them to work through on a daily basis, a weekly basis, whatever they need. They had sponsors, they had the whole nine yards. So once again, going back to Jim's question, do you have any of those types of things in place in your organization? So I can tell you 
what you were sharing a minute ago, it, it really is about education, and, and I know we, we write a lot of policies. And, uh, I mean, daily we get conversations, I'm sure you can, can do you guys as well. Um, more and more employers are, are looking to be compassionate. Their, their co-workers are family. They're small businesses. That's what this country is built on. And so really educating them um, that this is a complicated brain disease addiction and, and getting them to understand that even in a small company, there is assistance, um, which is often followed up with not just 30 days, but often one year, two year, three years worth of drug testing to help keep accountability, but also help them get that long-term coaching as Mr. Siegel had mentioned. So we're seeing a huge trend shift uh, in lots of industries right now uh, that are doing exactly that. So. There's a cost to replacing employees. That cost is very high. You're bringing them up to speed, be functional in your facility, um, and, and to do their job. So once again, does anybody have any comments or thoughts? Go ahead. Thank you, you can it back again. Yeah, so one of the things, you know, we, we do within our company, obviously we have a second chance agreement and we're big on uh, employee education. And that's one of the things we're seeing from more and more clients that they're actually going out of their way to educate their staff. Because a lot of times when people start working with someone, they don't understand the company policy. They have everything going on there. And they're just not aware of some of those resources like you mentioned. They, they just don't have any awareness of that. A lot of them have in their insurance policies, uh, employee assistance programs, that even the people at the company aren't really very well versed in. So that if they're not versed in it, how is the staff gonna know they can utilize that? How can they be encouraged to, to step up and use those resources that might be available to them, especially if they wanna be proactive? If somebody's got a problem, you want them to be able to find a way to get help while they're still a valuable employee, while they still have a chance, and when they recognize that situation. So I think employee education is really huge, and we're seeing more and more companies move that direction where they're actually investing time to educate their staff and to make it really, really clear that there is not that stigma. And I think more and more companies really should be moving in that direction. Thank you. And when you talk about second chance agreements, you're talking about understanding the technology that you're dealing with as well, because a second chance agreement is only as good as what the technology is that you're using. For instance, marijuana can stay in the system six to eight weeks. So understand the drug that you're testing, understand the technology that you're using, and understand the limitations and, and how long it's gonna to take for that to clear the system before you pop that person for a potential second positive. Go ahead. So I just had a more of a question. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the second chance agreement and kind of what the what that policy is and what the procedures are, because I'd love to share that. If you want to if you want to go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so the second chance agreement comes in and it's implemented in quite a few different ways. Uh, usually it's going to involve some type of treatment or rehab. It usually it involves um, evaluation by a substance abuse professional. That's something that's required in DOT testing once they test positive. But usually they're going to go through that and that substance abuse professional is going to help you work through what is going to be needed to help them get from where they are to where they need to be. And then a second chance agreement really comes into place to following whatever plan that you have laid out for them. And it does involve the, the testing, like you said, like you said and, and making sure that it's the right kind of testing. Because if something's staying in their system, you know, for, for 30, 60 days, you know, they have to be able to kind of track that in some way. So putting plans in place to, to deal with that, and that's working closely with either um, your drug testing provider, with your substance abuse professional, with your counselors, to come up with that plan of action. And then putting that agreement in place that has what the repercussions are. And usually it's going to be kind of, a, it's kind of also a final chance agreement in most cases so that if they adhere to those terms, they remain drug free, they may have a series of ongoing random testing uh, for a period of time uh, to help enforce that. But that's really what it comes down to is putting that in place. Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Anybody else have any questions on that? You know, DOT started, for those of you that, probably most of you know this, but in uh, previously the Department of Transportation uh, airline pilots, truckers, train engineers, Coast Guard regulated businesses, they were only testing for the standard five panel drug test going back to 1993, cocaine, marijuana, PCP. 
As of January 1st of this last year, they've expanded that to include opioids because they have found that, no offense to truck drivers, but truck drivers or airline pilots are coming, passing the five panel drug test and they're on all types of drugs to keep them awake and so on. And now DOT tests for that too. And uh, it looks like, I just heard the other day, that uh, probably all the modes are going back up to 50% in their random testing rates because 2017 did not look good. A lot of positive rates went up because of the opioids. Um, so you're, you're finding that in every segment of the industry that the, the airline pilot and his wife who died three, four months ago, he was an airline pilot and they found him and his wife dead with the children at home uh, because he was taking opioids with her and they overdosed while the children were still in the house. Um, one of the other things that's happened in Colorado that just came to mind is because uh, David brought this up and everybody talked about what was happening. Edibles, marijuana edibles, is becoming a major problem in recreational states because the dispensaries are selling candy. Uh, to kids, teenagers. Uh, they're not supposed to, but just like alcohol and everything else, they get to it. And in Colorado, they're finding more and more emergency room uh, issues where people eat the edibles and they don't have the immediate impact and effect that they would normally have if they smoked it, so they think they haven't eaten enough. So they keep eating and eating and eating and eating, and then finally they find out they're overdosing on marijuana. And Colorado is experiencing that out there, uh, along with these dispensaries selling lollipops and candy that is full of marijuana and THC. So, You're higher dealing uh, at higher levels. Of at higher levels. Exactly. That's right. It's not. You know the old joke about your father's Chevrolet. Wasn't that a commercial years ago? The marijuana today is not the marijuana of the '60s and '70s. You're running 90 plus percent now with the marijuana today between cultivation and, and manufacturing and so on and so forth. So we're seeing high levels as high as 95, 96% in the oils. So the vape pipes that they're using, they're, they're not detectable for law enforcement. They're fooling the dogs, they're doing a lot of different things. But they're smoking dope and, and that dope is 95, 98% pure and it only takes one hit. It only takes the head of a gummy bear for you to potentially be positive, but people are not patient. They want immediate gratification. And so they're going through and eating an entire bag of gummy bears. And, and as Jim said, they're overdosing and they end up in the ER. There is a case out of Colorado where mom and dad were both, or I'm sorry, dad ate edibles. One home was in a psychotic state, pulled out the gun while mom was talking on the phone to law enforcement trying to get him help, he shot her and killed her, and then killed himself, leaving two kids by themselves. It's tragic. For every dollar that's spent, or that, that's made in revenue through taxes in Colorado, they're spending $5 in infrastructure to try and take care of all the people that are there. I want to add to what you were talking about with the DOT. Um, in, in the testing panels, we're also seeing a huge um, confusion. Most employers who call us up in our, in our centers and say, hey, we, we need to get you to come out tomorrow and do some testing, or we want you next week because we have a problem. Um, we found paraphernalia at our site. Um, what most employers, as, we, as we've written thousands of policies now, uh, they don't actually, they're not us. I think a lot of us here are in this industry are professionals or counselors. Uh, are, are impacted by drugs and, we, and we're educated, but the average employer, even someone in the HR department who might have taken some extra classes on, on drug testing, doesn't realize that if they go to a, you know, a, to buy a standard five panel drug test, because DOT still calls their, their, their panel a five panel, it's really testing about nine to 12 different type of metabolites and drugs. So you know, we highly recommend for all of our employers that are having that conversation because the panels are, the drugs are widely changing and what people are consuming, the younger kids are using drugs that are a little bit different than what might have been used 20 years ago to run a DOT-like panel. So that's just things to consider. That's why you talk to individuals like ourselves. But We as physicians are not prescribing codeine and morphine 
so much anymore. We're, we're prescribing oxycodone, hydrocodone, oxymorphone, hydromorphone. Those are the drugs that we're missing and are now called the opioids in combination with the opiates, which would be the codeine and the morphine. So it's very important for you to look at your policies for those employers who are out there and really determine what it is you're testing for and to understand the cutoff limits of, of what you're testing for. Every drug screen that's done has a cutoff limit placed on it. You need to understand that each modality of testing, whether it's hair, oral fluid, saliva, um, um, urine, they all have different cutoff limits. They all have different times of, of perception and times where they don't perceive it anymore. So understand what your testing modalities are and understand what the cutoffs are. Lori, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Of course, I'm going to try to put a minute in my mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, we're seeing um, so far this year uh, about, There's a, a mic right there for you. about a 1 to 2% increase in the expanded opiates that the federals put on us at the beginning of the year. So um, that little change that, not little, but that change that they made at the beginning of the year to um, start looking for different metabolites of the opiate class has really shown an uptick. Um, and I think when we produce the DTI uh, in the spring of next year for the 2018 statistics, you're going to see some real eye-opening um, information regarding the opiate positivity and how people are moving to different drugs of choice as well. So Thank definitely um, going to see some good information when that's produced. Who else? Come on, there's a bunch of you out there who haven't spoken and said anything. Does anybody have anything else? How about our human resource people? I'm not human resources, but uh, no. we're a commercial landscape company, so um, our, we're, we're pulling our employees from the uh, younger demographic um, around the, or below the poverty line. Um, we do offer counseling, but I would say, unfortunately, our counseling and rehab offerings are more reactive. It's not something that we're proactively trying to help those who might need it uh, understand that we offer it. We have a poster. You know, we feel good about having a poster, but that's definitely not enough. Um, we do offer aware training, so every office has someone who's trained to notice uh, the signs, not necessarily that they're currently high, but that they may have a drug or alcohol problem. We have at least one person in each of our locations across 13 states trained to um, spot that and try to get some help. Um, Drug-free workplace, zero tolerance policy, um, and going back to the rehab and counseling, we probably need to look at that in a second chance. Um, we also offer CPR first aid courses for all managers from crew leader uh, to regional vice presidents. Um, and last year we put in training on how to deal with drug overdoses as part of that. Um, the Narcan is something that uh, I'd like to see us be able to get in each of our vehicles in preparation um, in case we need that. Um, I did have one question. Um, how close are we in research on how to test a level of impairment for marijuana? Um, and kind of where is that, where is that, if so, Senator Schumer has some money in there to help with that, but what other resources have been given to us to try to get that down? I don't know about you guys, but I would say that we're still a ways off. They have not isolated, nor has anybody been willing to step up and say, because of the debates as whether or not um, it should be a Schedule One drug, no one has been willing to step up and say, at this percentage or nanogram percentage, we're going to call you positive. So in the workplace in, in the state of Florida, 0.05 is considered legally intoxicated with alcohol, OK? 50 nanograms is what we test for, for, for marijuana to be positive, 50 nanograms and above. So um, ultimately, no one has stepped up and said at this percentage. Now, there are groups out there that are called drug recognition experts that are within law enforcement, and they have been trained, they've been put through an extensive training to be able to determine impairment 
based off of physiologic signs. So um, I wish I could say that we, we have an answer to that, but we don't, not right now. And I can't tell you when that's really gonna be. Okay. Would you would you agree with this? It seems it's really kind of becomes more of a legal definition, especially with with, with marijuana, because there hasn't been an agreed upon standard of how it affects, because it affects so many people so differently. It's in the system for so long, uh, for different amounts of time. Whereas with alcohol, we've gotten to a period where there's more of a standardization, and we can make certain assumptions and be statistically accurate with that. I think that really comes down to it with marijuana, about figuring out what that is and how we can. You know, how we can manage that in that situation that seems exactly. to be an issue. And it's, it's a matter of time. I mean, we have to have enough data, and I, and I think some researchers were even, um, as you alluded to, afraid to really take the next step. I mean, the laws could change and reclassify this drug tomorrow, and it, it would impact, you know, why they're spending that money, right? So people are driven for different reasons. Somebody's going to have to step up and, and set that standard just like they did for alcohol. If there's no federal funding that's being discussed. There's no state funding that's being discussed. Part of the problem that you are dealing with here is there are many people that will argue with you who have significant qualifications, academic qualifications, and they will tell you that in their opinion, marijuana does not impair a person's ability to perform anything. Fly a plane, fly the shuttle, whatever you want to do. And because of that argument, nobody wants to take it on. And uh, the other problem that you have, I was reading an article just the other day, uh, some people believe it would have to be a blood test. You, you wouldn't have a breath alcohol test like you do with, uh, with alcohol. It would have to be a blood test to determine impairment. Well, then that brings up all kinds of constitutional issues of a law enforcement officer drawing blood. Illegal search and seizure. Yeah, illegal search and seizure. So the, the real issue that I unfortunately think is going to have to happen, and, and I say this with regret, is a major tragedy. A major tragedy where uh, someone, I mean, it could have been that limo driver, who 20 people died just the other day, largest in many years, death fatalities and DOT fatality. You're gonna have to have a major tragedy, and then someone is going to have to prove that that person was smoking marijuana during or immediately prior to the tragedy. And then there'll be an outcry of we have to determine impairment levels. And, but right now there is none. And every defense lawyer in the world tells you when states try and touch this, and the states try and pass some impairment issue where the officer on the side of the road can glassy eyes, slurred speech, uh, slow reactionary, uh, that the officer says, I believe you're impaired from marijuana. There's even cases where the person driving the vehicle has said, yeah, I was smoking. Now what are you gonna do about it? And every defense attorney says, if you take my client to court, I'll win every time in front of the jury, because I'm gonna ask you one simple question. How do you determine impairment? And there is no way to do it. There was a company in California recently, they thought they had had it, but it didn't work out the way they thought. So there isn't any major funding coming from anybody because you have to remember, <coughs> 31 states are moving in the direction as Mr. Siegel talked about that we shouldn't allow. They think it's okay. And the advocates for marijuana use rec recreationally, the people that have millions of dollars, and, and they have millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, and lots of lobbyists to make this legal, they constantly are saying, and we became aware a couple of years ago, that they had a meeting, just like this, but the room was much bigger, with a lot more people in it, advocates for marijuana, and their chairman got up there and said, we get it done medically first, and when the states pass it medically, then we behind the scenes start recreational. So there's a plan to all this, and hopefully we'll be able to stop it, but it's not looking too good right now. And the hemp bill is, is one of those boondoggles that's coming out right now because we can't distinguish the use from hemp. THC is THC is THC. So if they pass the hemp law and allow the farmers to grow hemp and the utilization of the oils from hemp, then we're not gonna be able to distinguish that like we can 
if there, there is such a thing as prescription marijuana, okay? So that's prescription marijuana. It's just in lower doses. And, and we can determine chemically between that and marijuana use. There is no difference between marijuana use from a hemp plant and marijuana use from marijuana. Does that make sense? Any of our EAP people, EAP people have anything more to say? Anybody else have anything they want to share? Well, we're close to time here, so I really would like to thank you all for coming. Did you have anything else, David, you wanted to share? No. Jim? Just one last thing. Uh, as I mentioned, pick this up from Lori back there from Quest. They are a great industry partner across this country in providing information. Also, anyone that is interested in more information about the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association, or if you'd like to join the DASA, I will tell you if you join today, the board voted to give you a 20% discount at any round table that we have in the country. You can see John here and he can get your information. Um, and or you can go to the website ndasa.com uh, you can join as an individual or you can join as an employer in the drug and alcohol testing industry um, it's a great organization we're very active from an advocacy standpoint an educational standpoint training we do a lot of training around the country uh, and we have our big conference coming up um, so if you do want to join today and i know one of you came back and asked me how to join you get 20% off the membership. The membership is usually like $295 a year, uh, and you get 20% off of that if you join today. If you see John, he can take your name down and get you all, all uh, hooked up there with the NDSA. Just want to say that it's been great. The vice chairman did a great job. Well, I'll thank David over here for sponsoring, but most importantly, there's cookies over here, and Mr. Siegel was baking these right before he came in. He brought them in this morning. So please don't leave uh, from utilizing his hospitality today. And on behalf of myself and everyone here, and I'm sure the vice chair is going to close with this, we want to thank you very much, Mr. Siegel, for hosting this. Absolutely. Today. Thank you very you much. Right up here. Thank you very much for being here. We hope you will join our organization. We look forward to working with you. Have a great night. Great day. Be safe.